Welcome friends, my name is Ren, and today I'm showing you what my brain looks like. I'm a big fan of Dimension 20 and their newest campaign, Mentopolis, a noir-style mystery that takes place inside the mind of a great scientist in the form of a city, where the characters are cognitive functions. It made me start thinking a lot about my own psyche, and how the show combines philosophy and psychology together, sparking some very interesting conversations. So if you like D&D, psychology, and art, you'll like this video. First, I'm going to talk about the elephant that will soon be painted into the room. Why is there so much rot, fungus, and thunderstorms cluttering my brain? To keep things brief and simple, I have bipolar disorder. Type 1, with schizoaffective features. And I've been in therapy since age 13 and medicated at age 15. Needless to say, my now assisted and controlled mind is vastly different from the dysregulated, emotionally unstable state it used to be in. But that's only one part of it. The other is that I deal with neurological and physical complications that still have an unknown cause. Others as a side effect of aforementioned medication, such as migraines, chronic pain, unstable balance, joint pain, and tremors. With being on the spectrum, the cherry on top of the neurodiversity cake, I see myself as a healthier, more lively, and flourishing version of myself compared to when I was untreated. Being in therapy and sticking to my meds have let me regulate my highs and lows, pretty much eliminated the psychotic features, and have left me very mentally healthy for all things considered. I do want to quickly explain something before I show you my mind, though. But if all you want to see is the final tour, that can be found in the chapters, and you can skip ahead to that. But otherwise, try to indulge me a bit. I know this is a private subject, but after thinking about how my entire life, the stigma of my diagnosis has followed me at work, school, even my own friends and family, I want to show people that those of us with bipolar disorder are more than what's on a sheet of paper or the meds some of us are prescribed. Because to some people, it doesn't make a difference what you've done or how better you've gotten if you're bipolar if you're schizophrenic you're crazy no matter what you do some people don't care about how hard you've worked to put it simply a healthy brain produces chemicals and endorphins normally right well mine doesn't so i have to buy mine and get it from a pharmacy i've had a motto taught to me by my therapist that really helped me get used to sticking with my meds store-bought is just fine, because it is. The stigma of psychiatric medications alone is a seriously important topic that I won't be discussing today. However, maybe I'll talk about it another time. I won't pretend my illness left untreated wasn't completely debilitating, but now that I'm in a stage of life where I've been working on my mental and emotional health for seven years, at this point, I'm comfortable talking about it because I feel like not enough people do. I don't know about you, but there seems to be this hard line in the sand of mental health stigma. There's the acceptable illnesses like anxiety, social anxiety, depression, ADHD on one side of the fence, where if you talk about these openly, you're considered brave and inspiration. And while it's hard for loved ones to hear, it's a pretty easy pill to swallow. And on the other side of the fence, you have the taboo illnesses to talk about. Bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, PTSD, OCD, BPD, ASPD, and so forth. The scary mental illnesses. I'm not trying to say anxiety and depression are less intense or severe as the quote-unquote taboo ones, but in my and in my loved one's personal experiences, there seems to be this divide. If a celebrity says they have anxiety, they're praised. They're called brave and inspirational, but if someone has a more taboo illness, they're encouraged to keep it under wraps and that they should be ashamed of it and not talk about it or keep it a secret. What I'm trying to say is that what I'm going to show you is what my brain looks like after getting better. So maybe if you deal with mental health problems, you can see that getting better is possible if you put the work in. Get treatment, go to therapy, apply healthy coping mechanisms, and so on. I'll never say it's easy. At one point, I never thought I would live past 16. But being 20 now, I know hearing something like this would have given younger me some hope. So that's my goal 
for today. Now that we've talked about where my brain used to be and where it's at now, let's talk about what that looks like to me. I thought long and hard about the way my brain works, the way it functions and operates interpersonally with myself and others, and I settled on the aesthetic and almost allegory that is naturalia and solar punk. Naturalia is when nature and organic living things overtake broken down man-made structures. Before I went on medication, I struggled to apply what I was learning in therapy. I wouldn't believe most of what was being said to me, but over time, the longer and harder I worked, the sick, broken down, and twisted parts of me slowly healed. They didn't go back to normal, but new things grew on top of them, in spite of them. And I stand here today the strongest and healthiest I've ever been, and if that's not the spirit of naturalia, I don't know what is. Throughout this piece, different, specifically chosen areas of the brain are covered in fungus. The fungus represents the parts of my brain my medicine affects me most significantly. If you don't remember all the parts of the brain, that's okay. I have a guide map for you we can look at. When making this map, I used this diagram from the Dana Foundation, but if it's not entirely accurate, that's okay. This is just a fun art challenge. Up first, we have the frontal lobe, responsible for higher mental functions like creativity, concentration, planning, judgment, and decision making. In my frontal lobe, you'll find the logic and art districts. Blooming out of the forest is Creativity Capital, a pencil-topped building that serves as the creative hub of my brain. Art pretty much runs a lot of the visuals of my mind. When I look around, I've gotten used to searching for common shapes and angles. I look for patterns and take note of colors and textures I want to implement in my own work. Think of this as a museum of my ideas. And there's a different studio for each media I work with, from digital art to embroidery to painting. To the right, you'll find the Logic District, with lots of fun locations to visit. First up is the Cerebral Cafe, where everyone in the frontal lobe goes to get their daily dose of caffeine and endorphins. Coffee is pretty integral to starting my day and waking up since my night meds make me very drowsy even into the morning most days. I also like brewing decaf chai at night when I want to work on art but don't want to stay up too late, which is when art district workers get their pick-me-up before starting the night shift. Next door is Analysis Tower. This massive building is responsible for analyzing social situations and making judgment calls. I'm on the spectrum and I have a hard time identifying expressions, often I have to do what I call face math, where I individually analyze aspects of someone's body language, like their eyebrows, posture, nose, or mouth, in order to try and figure out what someone is feeling. Because unless I've known you a long time, I can't really see how you're feeling unless you tell me. The same goes for most social interactions, especially with strangers. A little south, we have the Conscience Courthouse. This building is packed pretty much all the time. I'm a bit of a doom scroller, especially because of where I live and the minority groups I'm a part of, so different ethic and moral debates are always going on in my head, and I try not to focus too heavily on them because the news makes us, makes me sad. The news makes all of us sad. <laughs> This is also where my conscience serves as the Supreme Court judge on daily matters like social interactions and judgment calls. Finally, we have the Observatory, a pretty self-explanatory building. This location is responsible for perception and looking for details, whether I'm doing research on a topic or scanning my artwork. Beneath the frontal lobe, we have the temporal lobe, responsible for memory and emotion, and the home of the Association District. First up, we have the Feelings Factory. When I originally was drawing this building, it was supposed to be covered in mushrooms and ivy, but at such a small scale, it became too much. But it is canon that this factory has been overtaken by mushrooms and plants, since it's self-explanatory that my medication has a big hand in this area of my mind. That's where my emotions are processed and regulated before influencing the rest of the brain. To the left, we have Short-Term Tower, more commonly called the Short-Term Shroom. This building has been completely reformed as a toadstool mushroom, because honestly, one of the worst side effects I deal with is that my medication has a strong effect on my short-term memory. However, if we take a stroll down the stairway to memory, made of books, we will get to the Long-Term Library, also called the Archives, where my long-term memories are organized in the form of books neatly tucked into shelves. Moving on to the north, we have the parietal lobe, filled with not districts, but landmarks, as this lobe is responsible for awareness of the body and sensation. First on the left, you'll see a peculiar row of squiggles. These are meant to look like those nifty mushrooms that grow on tree bark. I placed these specifically here because this area of the lobe controls the sensation for muscle and skin, which my medicine focuses on. A little to the right, you'll see the brainstorm aka the representation of my migraines. To put it very, very simply, my brain produces lots of electricity. 
more than others. Because of this, along with stress and the chemical imbalance of bipolar disorder, I would have chronic patternless migraines with an aura. The longest one I ever had spanned more than a month and a half, and after that I stopped counting the days. Thankfully, I don't get them as often anymore, maybe a handful of times a month at most. Next up is Sensation Station. This radio tower is responsible for broadcasting information about the kinds of stimuli I'm experiencing, in particular when I get overstimulated by harsh noise, lights, or strong smells. A bit further down, we have the Hyperfixation Highway. This is why I have so many hobbies. <laughs> The way I like to think of it is this is a long enclosed bridge that crosses above the forest canopy where trucks of fun facts, TV shows, books, hobbies, and interests are driven back and forth between active and inactive distribution centers where they'll be dispersed through the conscious and subconscious mind. Deeper into the brain we'll see the Hearing Hall, which is a large concert hall that hosts not only what I'm actively listening to, but also categorizes the memories of all the things I've heard, such as songs I can't get out of my head. Finally, we have the Cerebellum, responsible for motor functions, balance, and posture, commonly known as the Motor District. This district used to be a broken down industrial area, but has since been reclaimed and brought to life thanks to the motor function fungus forest. This is also a big area where my medication has an effect. If I wasn't medicated, this area would be very damaged and polluted as I deal with a lot of chronic pain. This is the most fun I've had with an art challenge in a really long time. The vibrant colors, the highlights, the shadows, everything about working on this was honestly really therapeutic. When you live with an illness that's been really demonized and you're told your whole life that you and other people like you are scary just for having it, whether or not you've gone to a doctor, it really messes with you. And it took me so many years to unlearn that and see things like mental health with nuance. Therapy will teach you a lot of shit, and I hope more people can get some of it because honestly I think a good therapist could benefit everyone and I wish it was more accessible in the states. I got lucky, and not many others are. But art therapy is a thing too, and I think that's what this was for me. I used to think of my brain as a scary dark place that I had to avoid, but seeing that it could be bright and colorful after so many years of trying to heal it really brought things full circle for me. So many people talk about, you know, the before side of treatment and the during of treatment, but no one really ever mentions the after. It's never gonna be easy. I won't lie, the road to where I am now was hell. But no one wants to stop in hell, right? So you have to walk through it. It cost me a lot, you know? Relationships, my job, vices that weren't healthy, and it cost me a lot of time, too. Seven years of my life were just spent on surviving hardship and overcoming my illness, but you know what? It was worth it. I would not trade one of the days or people or things I lost if it meant I was not where I am right now. This just started as a funky little Dimension 20 art challenge, but it turned into one of my favorite pieces of art I've ever made. I'm recording this at like 3.20 a.m., but I'm planning on just getting to work on the animated story time after this. It's a big video. It'll be the longest animation I've ever produced, but I'll still be making filler videos if I feel like it's taking too long. I've also made a Discord called The Crow's Nest that you can join if you'd like. It's very bare bones right now because I'm trying to learn how Discord works, but please take a look around if you'd like. But that being said, I hope you all stay hydrated, stay safe, and be yourselves. Ciao!